to our second reading in the Gospel of John, chapter 10. We return this morning to this 10th chapter of John, which is dominated by the imagery of the shepherd and the sheep. <clears throat> we saw last week that that was imagery which would be familiar to each and every one of Jesus' hearers. The hillsides around Jerusalem were covered with flocks of sheep. And it would also be familiar to them from their reading and hearing of the Old Testament. First of all, from the Old Testament history, where we read of men like Jacob keeping the flocks of Laban, his father-in-law, Moses also keeping the sheep of his father-in-law, Jethro, David keeping his father's sheep. All these examples of shepherds in the Old Testament, but also familiar from the spiritual analogy of the people of God as the flock, the sheep of God, the sheep of his pasture. And we have that in so many places. He is our God and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm and carry them in his bosom and gently lead those who are with young. And last week we saw how Jesus employed this familiar picture in a particular way. He had been in, engaged in controversy with the religious leaders in Jerusalem. Men who were supposedly the shepherds of God's people. But Jesus had observed their legalistic application of the Sabbath objecting to men and women being healed and made well because it was the Sabbath day. He had observed their harsh treatment of a man who was blind but Jesus had healed him on the Sabbath and how they had verbally abused that man and put him out of the synagogue all because he came to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And observing these things, Jesus confronted these men with this reality. They were false shepherds. They were no true shepherds of God's people. They were thieves and robbers come to steal and to kill and to destroy. And Jesus distinguished between the true shepherd and the false shepherd in this way. He said, I am the door. And he made clear that true pastors and shepherds of God's people enter by the door. Unlike these religious Pharisees and scribes who tyrannized over the people of God and had no reference at all to the Lord Jesus, the true shepherd enters by the door into the sheepfold. And we were reminded last week that those who are truly called by God to shepherd the flock of God will themselves first be converted men. They will be men who have been persuaded 
of their own sin and guilt. Their own need of salvation. And there will be men who have come to see in Christ the only Savior for, them, for their souls. And who have entrusted themselves. Themselves. First of all, before they are concerned with teaching others, they themselves will have entrusted themselves for time and for eternity to Jesus Christ, the ultimate shepherd. They will also have experienced a valid call from Christ to shepherd the flock, an inward spiritual desire to serve Christ in this way. And they will have received from Christ the necessary spiritual gifts to equip them to be the shepherds of his sheep. And their gifts and their calling will have been tested and recognized by the people of God who hear in their ministry the voice of the chief shepherd himself. So those who are true shepherds of God's people enter by the door Christ Jesus. And by contrast, the false shepherd, whom Jesus here describes as being thieves and robbers, in it for their own advantage, in it for personal gain, personal satisfaction, or in some cases, even perhaps willfully, to destroy the flock of God. But these false shepherds, they do not enter by Jesus Christ. They do not entrust their own salvation into the hands of the Lord Jesus in repentance and in faith. They are not motivated by a scripturally valid call to serve God's people in this way. They do not have the desire to see Christ magnified and glorified above all. They do not have the desire to preach him as being the only way of salvation, the only door into the sheepfold by which every one of us must enter in order to be saved. Well, so much for the first ten verses which we considered together last week. Now, at verse 11... Our Lord changes the way in which he uses this picture. Instead of saying, I am the door, as he said before, now he says, I am the good shepherd. Now, this need not puzzle us, because an illustration may be used in more than one way. And if you think for a moment about the imagery of Old Testament worship, the sacrifices and the priesthood and the tabernacle and all the other things which were present in that symbolic worship in the Old Testament, when we look at that, what we see is that the sacrifices represented Christ, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. But also, the priests represented Christ because Christ offered himself a sacrifice for our sins. And the priests themselves are symbolic of the Lord Jesus, not only the sacrifice, but also the one offering the sacrifice. 
and then interceding before God for all his people as our high priest. And the place where all this took place was in the tabernacle. But the tabernacle also represents Christ. Because the tabernacle was the place where God met with man. And when Jesus came into the world, John describes it in his first chapter in verse 14, he became flesh and tabernacled among us, and we beheld his glory. Jesus is the place where we encounter God. And so he is also the tabernacle. And in the Old Testament, there are so many images and pictures, so many of which directly point to the Lord Jesus. And it's the same here. This picture of the shepherd and the sheep and the sheepfold and the door and so on. The door is Christ, but he's not only the door, he is also the chief shepherd of the sheep. And Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. I think the word good here is not to be understood in the sense of benevolent and kind, though of course that would certainly be true. Rather, I think the word here is used to mean excellent. I am the excellent shepherd. I am the ultimate shepherd. Other men are called to be shepherds of God's flock in a secondary sense, under shepherds. And yet these all fail in many ways. None of them is perfect. And there is only one perfect shepherd who is 100% able to shepherd all God's people in every place fully and perfectly in every circumstance. And that shepherd, the shepherd par excellence, the good shepherd, the perfect shepherd, is the Lord Jesus himself. And this morning, as God enables us, we will consider what our Lord teaches about himself as the good shepherd. First, I think we should note that this expression tells us about the person of the Lord Jesus. He is the eternal Son of God. You see, this picture that he's using is rooted in the Old Testament. And the Old Testament, too, had its under-shepherds, the kings and the civil rulers and the priests and the prophets and so on. These were under-shepherds caring for God's people, but there was only one ultimate ruler. There was only one ultimate shepherd, and that was God himself. David said, the Lord is my shepherd. Psalm 80 verse 1, give ear, O shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock. And of course it is a prayer addressed to God himself. And in Ezekiel uh, chapter 34, we read God saying this, he says, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out. I will seek out my sheep and deliver them. I will feed them on the mountains of Israel. I will feed them in good pasture. I will feed my flock and cause them to lie down. I will seek what was lost and bring back what was driven away. Bind up the broken and strengthen that which was sick. Ezekiel 34. God is saying, 
I am the shepherd of my people. And you see, when Jesus says, I am the good shepherd, he is claiming what had always been the prerogative of God himself. And then notice something more. At the end of Ezekiel 34, in verse 23, God goes on to say this, I will establish one shepherd over them, and he shall feed them, my servant David. He shall feed them and be their shepherd. Now, the important thing to notice here is that these words were written centuries after David was dead. So he cannot be referring to King David in person. But he is referring to the one who was the promised son of David. The one who would come of David's lineage. The one who would be David's descendant. And who would assume the throne of David to reign over the people of God forever. He will be the shepherd. Well, does that mean that God was giving up being himself the ultimate shepherd and handing it over to someone who was a mere man? No, it doesn't. Listen to this. Zechariah chapter 13 verse 7. Zechariah 13 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion, says the Lord of hosts. The old King James Version translates it, the man who is my fellow. The same word is used in other places, translated neighbor, my fellow man. But here it is the Lord himself who speaks of this shepherd as being the man who is my fellow. And when we put this together, what we see is exactly what John tells us in the beginning of his gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. He is God's fellow. He is himself God, the eternal Son of God. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. He took upon himself the seed of David. He came born into this world through the Virgin Mary, a descendant of David, to reign over the kingdom of God. And the Good Shepherd is none other then the eternal Son of God, who was with God in all eternity, but was made man for us, God manifested in the flesh. True God and true man in the one glorious person of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Jesus says, I am the good shepherd. And this expression also tells us about the work of the Lord Jesus. Why did the Son of God become man? It was so that he could lay down his life for the sheep. Verse 11, the good shepherd in the New King James Version, it says, gives his life for the sheep. Uh, most of the other translations, I think, are better in saying the good shepherd lays down 
his life for the sheep. Well, that is what Jesus says here, and it's also what we just read in Zechariah 13, 7. Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is my companion. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. This shepherd is going to be struck with the sword. In other words, he is going to die a violent death. And Jesus became man in order that he might in his death make atonement for the sins of his people. That he might pay their debt, that he might satisfy the justice of Almighty God. The Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. God had said to Adam in the day that you eat of that forbidden tree, dying you shall die. And the entire human race through Adam incurred the penalty of both physical and spiritual death. And God could not simply overlook sin. His holiness demanded that he express his moral indignation against it. His righteousness and justice demanded that he punish it appropriately. And either the sinner must die or someone in his place must pay the penalty. Now God himself could not pay the penalty because God cannot die. He is the eternal, unchangeable, immortal God. No angel could pay the penalty because that simply wouldn't be fair. It was man who sinned and it was man who must pay the penalty. And the only way for God to forgive sin consistent with his justice and his holiness was for the eternal Son himself to take upon himself a human nature and in that human nature to pay all that was owed the penalty of sin. And so it was necessary that the Son of God must become man. He must become a new Adam. O loving wisdom of our God, when all was sin and shame, a second Adam to the fight and to the rescue came. O wisest love that flesh and blood which did in Adam fail should strive afresh against the foe, should strive and now prevail. He must personally fulfill all the demands of God's holy law and he must pay in our place the penalty of our breaking of that law. And so it was necessary that for our salvation, Christ the eternal Son should become one with us, that he might act as our representative act in our place. He had to take upon himself a true human nature, a physical body, a real mind and soul and spirit, he had to be born under the law and he had to fulfill all God's holy law perfectly in this life. And then he had to lay down that perfect holy life to lay it down in death when he took upon himself the judgment for our sins bearing our sins in his body on the tree. God 
could not simply ignore sin. God is holy. God is righteous. And it was necessary that God's moral indignation against our sins be expressed. And in the death of Jesus, God expressed what he thought and felt about sin when he meted out the judgment that our sins deserved, but he meted it out upon Christ, the good shepherd in the place of the sheep, that the sheep might be forgiven. There's a beautiful hymn that expresses some of these things. O Christ, what burdens bowed thy head? Our load was laid on thee. Thou stoodest in the sinner's stead, didst bear all ill for me. A victim led, thy blood was shed. Now there's no load for me. Jehovah lifted up his rod. O Christ, it fell on thee. Thou wast sore stricken of thy God. There's not one stroke for me. Thy tears, thy blood beneath it flowed. Thy bruising healeth me. Jehovah bade his sword awake. O Christ, it woke against thee. Thy blood that flaming blade must slake. Thy heart its sheath must be. All for my sake, my peace to make. Now sleeps that sword for me. We must also understand that what Jesus did in laying down his life for the sheep went far beyond what any ordinary good shepherd would do. Such a man, a good under-shepherd, might well risk his life for the sheep. He might put his life in danger. But even as he risks his life putting it in danger, he will still make every effort to save his own life along with that of the sheep. He will do his best not to be torn apart by the wolf. But you see, Jesus went far beyond that. What he did was not simply to risk his life. He laid it down. It was his deliberate purpose and intention to die for the sheep. Because he knew that if he should save himself, he could not save the sheep. And the Lord laid down his life. He gave himself a ransom in the place of those doomed to die. Jesus goes on to tell us about his motive in laying down his life. We've seen that uh, what he did went far, far beyond what an ordinary shepherd would do. And it's also, of course, in the starkest contrast to what a mere hired shepherd would do. Verse 12, an hireling, a hired hand, he who is not the shepherd, one who does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and flees. And the wolf catches the sheep and scatters them. A mere hired man will certainly not lay down his life for the sheep. He won't even put his life in danger for the sheep. If he sees the wolf coming, he may well do what he can, but the moment that there is personal danger to him, 
he will be gone. Why does he flee? Jesus tells us in verse 13, the hireling flees because he is an hireling and does not care for the sheep. And that is in contrast, stark contrast, to the Lord Jesus. Verse 14, I am the good shepherd and know my sheep and am known by my own. As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. They are his sheep. They belong to him. And he knows each one intimately. And not only that, but they know him. There is this mutual knowledge. The shepherd knows the sheep, the sheep know the shepherd. And this is emphasised very emphatically in verse 15, although unfortunately the translation here is not uh, really adequate. Um, As the Father knows me, even so I know the Father, is really better translated, just as the Father knows me, and we have to go back to the previous verse, Um, I know my sheep, and am known by my own, just as the Father knows me, and I know the Father. In other words, he is drawing a parallel between his knowledge of the Father and the Father's knowledge of him, which is a a very personal relationship, the Father and the Son, he is saying that that is a parallel to his knowledge of the sheep and the sheep's knowledge of their shepherd. And he is drawing attention here to an immensely important fact about being a Christian. The fact that it is something intensely personal. Being a Christian is not simply about being born in a particular country, being born in a particular family. It's not about intellectual belief in certain things about God, even if those things are in fact true. Do you remember how James deals with this in chapter 2 of his epistle? And he speaks with great sarcasm to some, and he says, You believe that there is one God? Congratulations. You do well. Even the devils believe that, he says. It's mere intellectual knowledge. You have this intellectually correct knowledge that there is one God. Yes, but what good is that going to do you? By itself, that is nothing. There is nothing personal about that. Being a Christian is not about trying to live a decent life, to apply certain moral principles, maybe trying to live by the Ten Commandments, maybe trying to implement the Sermon on the Mount. There's nothing personal about that approach to things. You can try to live by the commandments without involving the Lord Jesus at all. But being a Christian is something personal. It is a two-way commitment. And we are told here that Christ knows his people and his people come to know him. Christ's knowledge of his people, Christ's knowledge of you, if you're a Christian, did not begin when you became a Christian. It did not begin when you first began to be interested in these matters. If you are a Christian, Christ, the Good Shepherd, knew you before the foundation of the world. And God himself chose you in Christ to belong to him, 
to be one of his sheep forever. And when you heard the gospel and began to pay attention to it, it was because Christ, the shepherd, was calling one of his sheep, the sheep that had been given to him by the Father from all eternity, the sheep whom he knew totally. He knew that you were one of his sheep even at a time when nobody else would have known that. But Christ knows his sheep and has known them from all eternity. And not only that, but the sheep come to know him. Now, there's an important difference here because they have not always known the shepherd. You think, for example, of the Apostle Paul. There was a time when he certainly did not know Christ as his shepherd. On the contrary, he hated the Lord Jesus. He would do everything within his power to exterminate this new Christian religion from the earth. But Christ knew him and Christ called him. And Paul came to know the Lord Jesus. And that knowing Christ, his shepherd, became the most important thing in his life. Listen to what he says in Philippians chapter 3. He says this, But what things were gained to me, these I've counted loss for Christ. Indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellence of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I've suffered the loss of everything and count these things as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in him not having my own righteousness which is from the law but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. And for Paul, knowing Christ became by far the most important thing in his life and he was willing to give up everything for that knowledge. I have to ask you, is your Christian faith personal? It's one thing to be born into a Christian home, to have Christian grandparents and Christian parents, maybe Christian great-grandparents and cousins and aunts and uncles, but you can have all that and that doesn't affect you. And it's much more than simply having correct intellectual understanding. Anybody who has a brain and a little application can learn the doctrines of the Christian faith and understand them quite well. They're not so hard to understand. But you can have that and have nothing personal, have no personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Can you say with David, the Lord is my shepherd. He leads me. Though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Elsewhere, David says this, I am poor and needy, but the Lord, Jehovah, thinks upon me. There is something intensely personal about being a Christian. Do you know the Lord Jesus as your shepherd? Well, then in verse 16, Jesus says something else. Other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Other sheep I have. Do you realize that for you and for me 
there are no more important words written in the scriptures. Other sheep I have. Jesus was talking to Jews. He was talking to the physical descendants of Abraham, those who belonged to the tribes of Israel. They belonged to what until then had been the one nation in this world with knowledge of the true God. They had his commandments, they had his war through the prophets. Every spiritual privilege in this world belonged to the Jews. Israel was the sheepfold of God. Every other nation was left to walk in the darkness of false religion. And the Jews assumed that it would always be like that. And Jesus says, other sheep I have, which are not of this fold. Gentile sheep, non-Jewish sheep, pagans immersed at this point in false religion without God and without hope, and yet they are my sheep. Sheep who as yet know nothing about the Good Shepherd, nothing about the way of salvation, and yet in God's gracious, predestinating purposes, they belong to Christ. And Jesus says, them also I must bring. And to you who are here in the church this morning, if you are a Christian, you are one of Christ's other sheep. You were not born a Jew, were you? You are Gentiles. You belong to a nation far off from Israel and Jerusalem. You have no physical connection with Abraham as your father. But Christ says, I have other sheep. I have sheep from every nation throughout this world. And he says, them also I must bring. He is speaking about what was going to happen after his death and resurrection and ascension into heaven. After he had received the promise of the Father and poured out the Spirit on the day of Pentecost, then his people were to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. They were to tell men and women indiscriminately, there is a Savior for you. Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And that is exactly what happened. It began in Samaria. The Samaritans certainly didn't belong to the Jewish fold, but Philip went down to a city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. And they became believers in the Lord Jesus. Then Philip was told to do something very strange. He was told to go down to the Gaza desert. And he went down to the Gaza desert and there there was an Ethiopian man riding in a chariot returning home to Ethiopia. And Philip preached to him Jesus and he believed and he was baptized and he went on his way rejoicing. He was one of Christ's other sheep. And then at Caesarea, um, Peter was sent to Cornelius the Gentile. He did what he had never done in his life before. He entered a Gentile house and he preached the Lord Jesus. And as he was preaching the word of God, the Holy Spirit fell upon those who heard. And they became believers in Jesus. They were Christ's other sheep. And then we read of how there were others. And they traveled, we're told, as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and then Antioch, preaching the word 
to none but the Jews only. But then, at Antioch, some began to preach to the Gentiles. And we read that a great number believed and turned to the Lord. And Antioch became one of the most significant churches in the history of the world. A church comprised of Jews and Gentiles together in the one flock of Jesus. The first such congregation in the whole world. And then from there, sometime afterwards, the Holy Spirit led the leaders of the church as they were fasting and praying and seeking the will of God. He led them to send out Paul and Barnabas and to go out into the Roman Empire to begin the great Gentile mission of the church to preach throughout the whole world the Lord Jesus. And through it, Christ the Good Shepherd was calling his other sheep. And that is still going on throughout the whole world. Wherever the gospel is preached, Christ is calling his sheep. They hear his voice speaking to them through his word, speaking to them through the under-shepherds. They hear his voice and they follow him and they become part of that one flock of the Lord Jesus the church of the living God in this world. And finally, Jesus tells us that all of this was in accord with the plan and the purpose of God. Therefore my Father loves me, because I lay down my life that I may take it again. The Father was well pleased with the perfect obedience of Christ his Son. Even obedience unto death, even the death of the cross, laying down his life for the salvation of men and women in all the world. But of course it would have been no use, Christ laying down his life, unless he took it again. We need a living saviour, a dead saviour, would be of no value whatsoever. And Jesus laid down his life, a full, a perfect sacrifice for the sins of his people. And when the sacrifice was accepted and finished, he rose from the dead in power and in glory. He was taken up into heaven, the living shepherd and saviour of all who come to God by him. It was all of God. This command I have received from my Father. He came into the world to do the will of God, laying down his life, dying for his sheep, rising again, and calling men and women from every nation under heaven. Are you one of Christ's sheep? Have you come to God in repentance and in dependence upon nothing else, nothing else but the death of Jesus Christ in your place. Have you come to God through Jesus Christ? Is he your risen shepherd? Is the Lord your shepherd? May it be so. Amen.